Good evening, everybody. We are going to be in Judges 21 this evening. We're actually finishing up the book of Judges tonight. Um, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for tonight, Lord. And thank you for gathering us together in your name. And just ask, and we welcome your presence here this evening, Lord. And we just ask that you uh, open our hearts and our minds to hear from you, Lord. And I just ask that you help me get out of the way that you may speak to those that need to hear from you tonight, Lord. And just ask that you continue to empty us of ourselves and fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that uh, we just may keep our eyes focused on you, Lord, and, and not on ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So we've been studying the book of Judges for about 20 weeks now. I mean, it's, time flies, you know. It doesn't really seem that long. But uh, so over this whole book, the past 20 weeks, we've kind of seen the same cycle over and over and over again in the book. Um, that sin, servitude, supplication, salvation. Over and over and over again. We see this theme start off even in early in Judges chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. So we see there the sin of the people of Israel. The Lord said, why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side. We can see the servitude in that. And their God shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke the words, words to the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. We see a representation of the supplication there. And in verse 16 of chapter 2, it says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hands of those who plundered them. So we finally see the judges lead them through to their salvation. So the Israelites, they fall into sin. Their sin leads to bondage and servitude. Eventually they cry out to God in supplication, and then God sends them a judge to deliver them from their servitude. We see it over and over again. The cycle, it seems to begin with disobedience and sin. We see that in uh, chapter 2, 11. It says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God their, of their fathers. And they brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. In chapter 3, verse 7, So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and served the Baals of Ashtoreth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Again, chapter one or chapter four, verse one. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and sold in the hand of the Jabin king of the Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Chapter six, verse one. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of uh, Midian for seven years. Chapter ten. Verse 6. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals of the Asherahs, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. They continue to fall into sin and fell into this vicious cycle over and over and over again. Why do they continue to fall into sin? We can see that. We jump a little bit ahead tonight in chapter 21, the last verse, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did 
what was right in his own eyes. So they did what was right in their own eyes instead of obeying a king. It led to bondage and suffering. It was true then. It's been true for thousands of years. And it's true today. We'll see that same vicious cycle in our own lives when we decide to do what we think is right in our own eyes instead of doing what pleases our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Or worse yet, when we fail to even acknowledge Jesus at all. I know I've seen it in my own life, you know, making different decisions over and over again, not thinking of God first, you know, and continue digging a hole deeper and deeper for myself that I just can't seem to get out of, you know. And you sit there and not thinking of what God wants from you. You try to decide you know what's best and you do, you know better than God what to do and you dig this hole for yourself deeper and deeper and deeper. And then finally you sit and you cry out to the God and say, Lord, God, why have you put me in this hole? You know, why am I here? You, you put me here. You know, why God? You know, I'm stuck and help me. We've seen this vicious cycle throughout the book of Judges and we're going to see it again tonight. Tonight we finish the account of the Levite and his concubine that we started a couple of weeks ago in Judges 19. You know, when he, uh, the Levite gave his concubine to the men of Gibeah and uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, and they abused her and, and they killed her, divided her into pieces throughout Israel. The whole account, um, really tough teaching. Um, I know when the schedule came out, um, for judges and we got that far in the schedule I looked right away to see who would have judges 19 because I knew that account was just so bizarre and just so horrible and to stand up here and try to teach the Word of God when that's it um, just how hard that would be and of course we know Randy you got that teaching and, and Randy said himself you know I wonder you know why would God give me a teaching you know, that teaching to do of all people, you know. And, and I, I don't know why he gave you that one. But um, I can tell you it was heartfelt. And uh, it was honest. And, and it was emotional. And there's been a few teachings here, especially early ones that when I came, when the Lord was seeking me out, that certain things a pastor has said that have stuck to me, my... For, all the whole time and I'll remember the rest of my life and that teaching you gave I'll remember the rest of my life so uh, thank you for allowing the Lord to use you in such a mighty way it was wonderful and uh, thank you for trusting him to carry you through that you know and not to mention it was your first teaching you know as pastor are you kidding me right now you know that was it was amazing I mean it really was so after that, we saw Pastor Gill followed up last week with, the, with the, what the, the Levite lying about what happened with his concubine, or at least not telling the whole truth about it, and uh, planting these seeds of hate and rage in the hearts of the Israelites against their brothers, the Benjamites. And we saw that bloody war that almost wiped out the Benjamites, leaving only the 600 men of them at the Rock of Rimmon. So that brings us tonight, uh, chapter 21, verse 1. Now the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah, saying, None of us shall give his daughters to Benjamin as a wife. So because of what the Levite told the children of Israel about what the men of Gibeah did to his concubine, they made this oath. And tonight we're going to see that this rash oath that they made had unforeseen consequences. Verse 2, when the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening, they lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel? They lifted up their voices and wept. It's a baka. In Hebrew, it means to be well or to have great regret over it, you know. So here they are, they're 
they're crying out to the Lord, you know, like it was his doing that the tribe of Benjamin was almost wiped out, when in reality it was their own thirst for vengeance against their brothers that brought it about. God allowed it to happen just to, just to show them. Verse 5, verse 4, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who do not come up with the assembly to the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. So not only had they made this foolish vow not to give the Benjamites their daughters for wives, but they also vowed to kill, kill anyone who didn't participate in that vow. Um, it doesn't make sense, you know? And it's almost like the whole thing we talked about, beating somebody over the head with, with a Bible doesn't work, you know? Threatening them doesn't work. If it did, we'd all have brick Bibles, you know? And that just doesn't work. It just really seems like it's a, a foolish vow that they shouldn't have made. Um, we've heard it said before, it's better just not to make a vow than to break one. Um, so maybe it's best if you just don't make one. We've seen it in Scripture before. Stupid vows have been made in the Bible before. I mean, think about it. Remember Saul's vow in uh, 1 Samuel 14, battling the Philistines? He said, nobody shall eat anything till evening until I've had my revenge on the Philistines, you know? And of course, his son, Jonathan, who fought valiantly against the Philistines, dipped his rod in honey and ate from it. He's all, you broke the vow. And his father, Saul, wanted to kill him for it. You know, it's just a foolish vow. But of course, the people, the people save him from that. We all know here in Judges, uh, Jephthah from Judges 11. You know, Lord, if you deliver me from this, if... If I survive this, if I'm victorious, then I will offer the first thing that comes out of my house to you as a burnt sacrifice, you know? And instead of being a cow or a chicken or something, it was his only daughter, his only child, you know? It's neat, a couple things that I've learned is We've heard it said before, it's better just to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than open it up and prove it, you know? That's so true, you know? Um, that one and the other, the other one was just maybe try to think before you speak, you know? Um, my whole life, I've, I've been kind of known as sandpaper, you know? I, I'm a little rough on people. People find me a little rough, you know? I've always been like that, you know? I'm working on it. That's why people, a lot of people say, oh, lesson's pretty quiet. It doesn't talk a lot. Hey, I'm afraid to. You know, I'm afraid of what's going to come out of my mouth, you know? I'll probably offend you. Um, but those two things, you know, um, maybe just be quiet, you know? Be thought of fool, then open yourself and prove it, and then maybe just try to think before before you say something, you know? That works really well. I've been working on that one a lot. And a lot of times you sit there and right before you do it, your mouth almost opens up. You're like, and then you almost think about what you would have said. And then you play in your mind exactly how that would have gone. And it's not good. You know, you're like, wow, I'm learning, you know? I'm learning just to keep my mouth shut, you know? Um, it doesn't always work, you know? I know even like just today, today alone, a, a lot going on today, and it was one of those days that I knew was going to be kind of special, and I was all, Lord, today is a day that you can show me something, you know, I, it had a different feel about it, and I was all, I, ha I have a lot of questions um, that I know you have answers to, Lord, so I, I want you to, to show me today and answer some questions for me today, you know, and um, he did, and what he showed me is that uh, I'm still so prideful, you know, I'm prideful, um, I'm still angry. Um, I speak without thinking. I'm ruled by my anger. Um, I have a long way to go, you know. And in the end, it, it's the whole thing is that it almost can be like a bad thing, you think. You know, you're, oh, wow, you know, that's almost a step backwards. But it's really not, you know. You sit there. You stumble forward and go further on and on and on, but if you're blind to it and you're stumbling around, you have no direction, you know? Sometimes when that Lord just stops you for a minute, you know, and, 
and backs you up. He takes a step back and he clears everything up for you and you can just see clearly, you know. Maybe you don't have to always be moving forward um, to be better off and be closer to the Lord, you know. He showed me today that uh, just by showing me how far I have still to go, that that in itself was almost like a step forward, you know, and there's blessings in that. And we talked about it before, closed doors, those aren't a bad thing. You know, when, when doors are slammed in your face, sometimes they hurt, but just to stand there at closed doors, banging on them and scratching at them, trying to knock through them, you know, there's no reason, you know. It's like, why, why Lord, did you slam that door in my face? It's, it's just because he wants you to go in a different direction. You know, that's all, just trust in him. Just trust in him. And maybe just think before you speak. That helps out a lot. And if you're angry, don't even bother saying anything. Just wait. Just wait till you're not angry anymore. So here they are. They didn't even want to associate with the Benjamites anymore, given their daughters for wives. And in fact, they wanted to destroy them. They almost did destroy them. And not only that, they wanted to destroy anybody else who didn't share their views, you know? It's just, it might have sounded like a good idea at the time, but when you look back, it just seems like one bad idea after another, you know? Um, not putting the Lord first, doing what you think is right, and just digging a hole for themselves, you know? Um, it's so, it, it's amazing, you know? It's amazing what poor choices were made when they didn't have a king on the throne, and they were doing what was right in their own eyes. And the same can be said for us before we made Jesus our king, we started to obey him instead of doing what we thought was right in our own eyes. You know, how did it work out for you guys? I know we've all been there in the past. You know, some of us are there right now. How's it working out? You know, it, it did not work out very well for me. Verse six. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother, and said, One tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for the wives of those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? And they said, What one is there from the tribes of Israel who do not come up to Mizpah to the Lord? And in fact, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted, indeed, no one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. <clears throat> so the congregation sent out their 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. I mean, that just floors me, you know. So they're crying out to the Lord, why have you done this to us? You wiped out this whole tribe, you know. Um, what are we supposed to do? We can't break our vow to you, you know. How, how we, we made a vow to you. How are we supposed to remain godly? You know, if we break our vow, we're going to have to go destroy all these women and children and all these men, this, this whole town, and just slaughter them to remain holy, you know, so we don't break our vow to you? Does that really make sense? That, that doesn't make any sense, you know? And as I read through it, it, it even gets worse in here, but as I read through it, you just start seeing all these bad decisions, one right after another, that are made when you do what's right in your own mind, in your own eyes, and not, not following the Lord, you know? And it's like, how, it's ridiculous. How could you make that decision? How could you see that that was right? You know, but then you just step back and I think about my own life, you know, before I knew the Lord and the decisions that I made and how ridiculous those decisions were, you know, and it's the same thing. Oh, Lord, why have you put us in this hole? You know, the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother. This word grieved, it's nakam. It means to be sorry or to have regret and to be comforted. But it also can mean to repent. So instead of feeling sorry for, them, for themselves and trying to comfort one another, Israel should have just repented of their foolish oath that they made a Mizpah, and they should have agreed to give their daughters as wives to the Benjamites and just avoided the slaughter of the city. Um, God would understand that. 
he probably knew when they made that oath, you know, you're so silly making an oath like that, you can't keep, you know. They should have just repented. But then again, how could they repent to God when they were doing what they thought was right in their own eyes to begin with? And like I said, they're too busy thinking, I know what's right for me. I know what's better than God to do. Like I said, we can get so upset with God when doors are slammed in our faces when we think that those are the doors that should be open to us and we know better than God does. They had told the Israelites, we make a vow or die. You know, They actually had found a city that no one had come to, to Mizpah, to make that, that vow and to give their daughters to the tribe of Benjamin, this Jabesh Gilead. So they said, you know, make this vow or die. You didn't come? You didn't come when we told you to come make this vow? When we told you that we could put you to death? So by that, it provided the justification for punishing Jabesh Gilead and providing wives for the Benjamites. <clears throat> Verse 11. And this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utter utterly destroy every male and every woman who has known a man intimately. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately. And they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. So because they didn't want to break that foolish vow they made to the Lord, they proceeded with this ungodly massacre of a whole town, except for these 400 virgins, uh, which they took away with them. It's just heartbreaking when you think. Um, men might be a little different than women on this, you know. You think about your wedding day. Um, beautiful day for both the, the bride and groom. Um, men probably don't really start thinking about their wedding day until you actually find the one you're going to marry, you know. Once you see her, you're all, you know, that, that day almost becomes a reality in your mind, you know. But with women, you know, you've heard about those girls, you know, dreaming about their wedding day, you know, in elementary school, saying, I'm going to marry you one day, you know, and having their little books and all their things, and they dream about this beautiful day growing up, you know, and, and getting married and having the fairy tale and being the princess of their own lives and all that, you know. It's just a wonderful thing, part of growing up, you know, that a lot of women do. And it's just, you know, they think of this wedding day bliss that they're going to have, you know. And I just can't help to think about these 400 young virgins, you know, that they're sitting there, you know, living their lives with their families. And then come thousands of raiders in, slaughtering their parents, slaughtering their brothers, um, slaughtering everybody except for them, and then taking them away to be wives for the Benjamites, you know. And it's just like, well, there's there's your wedding day bliss, you know, um, because they didn't want to break their vow to the Lord, you know, they wanted to stay godly. It just doesn't, it's heartbreaking. You know? Verse 13, then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the Rock of Rimen and announced peace to them. Oh, now we have peace. Okay, great. So Benjamin came back at that time, and they gave them the women who they have saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead, and yet they had not found enough of them. I just find it interesting how they gave them the women who they had saved alive, you know. It's how you think about those women that were taken away, you know, and just the heartbreak that they have you know, losing their families and, and being there and their world just being destroyed, you know, and there's those Benjamites just like, you know, you need to, you need to change your attitude a little bit, you know, I saved you, you know, it's like, really, really, you saved them, okay. So the 400 versions, they weren't enough. There were 600 men of Benjamin at the Rock of Ramon, so they actually still did not have enough of them. Verse 15. And the people grieved for Benjamin, because the Lord had made a void in the tribe of Israel. Again, O oh Lord, why? Why have you put us in this situation, you know? 
Then the elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for the wives, for wives, for those who remain, since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? And they said, There must be an inheritance for the, for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them wives from our daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn an oath, saying, Cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. Then they said, In fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem, and south of Lebanon. Therefore they instructed the children of Benjamin, saying, Go, lie in wait in the vineyards, and watch, and just when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dances, then come out of the vineyards, and every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh. Then go to the land of Benjamin. Then it shall be, when the fathers of their brothers come out to us to complain, that we'll say to them, Be kind to them for our sakes, because we did not take a wife from any of them in the war, for it's not as though you have given the woman to them at this time, making yourselves guilty of your oath. So, it's interesting. Some scholars, this feast that they're talking about, they're all, well, we'll just go um, to this feast in Shiloh. Many believe that it's a celebration of Passover that's held in the spring. It, uh, they point to the dancing of Miriam and the Israelite women after the, the Red Sea crossing. We can see that in Exodus 15, verse 20. I can just read it for you if you like. It says in verse 19, For the horses of Pharaoh went with the chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Verse 20, Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. So it's possible some point to that that's that celebration in the springtime. Chances are, but really probably not. Um, more than likely, it's a celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, basically, why? Because it even says right there, it says, uh, go lie in wait in the vineyards. Um, so they're sitting there, they're hiding in the vineyards, right? So this points more to the fall, when the vineyards would be full with leaves and, and grapes. You'd be able to hide behind them. In the springtime, not so much, you know? So they believe that this is actually more um, a Feast of Tabernacles celebrated in the fall. So they're sitting here, you know, what are we going to do? Oh, you know, I got it. I got it. The problem is solved. We'll just let the men of Benjamin kidnap women from the vineyard. Just like that. We stay holy again, you know. Got it all figured out, you know, over and over again. Again, it just seems like one bad idea just after another. Continually dig in a hole that they just can't get out because of their sin and their foolishness. Like we said, the best thing to do would just be to stop. You know, call out to God, confess any sin and repent. And get, get right with God before you do anything else. Um, it's okay. We, we mess up. God knows it. You know, we mess up every single day. Instead of just piling bad decision on bad decision, digging a hole deeper and deeper, just stop. Just stop for a minute, you know? Relax. It's okay. Talk to the Lord. Repent of your sins and ask Him to guide you before you do anything else. It's interesting, too, because they said, you know, don't be mad at us. You know what I mean? You, I know your daughter got kidnapped, you know, but it's a good thing, you know. Thank God you didn't give her to us because that would have been bad for you. You know, you should be thanking us. <sighs> doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. This whole, the past three weeks has just been amazing just to show us what can happen when we have our eyes on ourselves and, and not on the Lord. Verse 
Verse 23. And the children of Benjamin did so. And they took enough wives for their numbers from those who danced, whom they caught. Then they went and returned to their inheritance, and they rebuilt the cities and dwelt in them. So the children of Israel departed from there at that time. Every man to his tribe and family, they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. So there you go, it all worked out in the end, right? Worked out perfectly. What a great plan we had, you know? I mean, if you ignore the fact that a whole city was massacred and hundreds of young virgins were kidnapped, besides that stuff, it all worked out great, you know? The tribe was restored, at least. Um, so much of the tribe of Benjamin was restored that it gave Israel its first king, right? First King Saul. I remember uh, after Saul became king, he went ahead and he, he saved that one city from the Ammonites, you know, and back in 1 Samuel chapter 11. 1 Samuel 11, verse 1, it says, Then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up in a camp against Jabesh Gilead, that same city. And all the men of Jabesh said to, to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. And Nahash, the Ammonite, answered them, on this condition, I will make a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes to bring reproach onto Israel. If you take out your right eye, you lose depth perception, so it would be harder to fight, harder to shoot a bow and arrow. You could be controlled. You'd be under control there. Verse 3 says, Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territories of Israel, and then, if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news in the hearings of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. And Saul said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words from the man of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, and he is in the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul when he heard this news. And his anger was greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And down in verse 11 it says, So it was on the next day that Saul put the people and three companies, and they came out in the midst of the camp in the morning watch and killed Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered, and no two of them were left together. So the people of Jabesh Gilead, they were close relatives of Saul. Saul of Benjamin. And that's why his anger was so aroused when they were messed with, and that's why he was so quick to defend them. Of course, we cover again in verse 25. Last verse of Judges. Why this whole book of Judges has been so crazy. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Throughout the whole book, that vicious cycle, sin, servitude, supplication, salvation, over and over again. The last three chapters have been just a mess. It reads like a horror story. But that's what happens when they didn't have a king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They lost their consciousness of God as their king, resulting in moral decline, social turmoil, and spiritual chaos. That's the same thing that happens to us if we forget God is our king. You know? The civil and religious confusion that existed during the time of Judges, it exists today. Because so many of us don't acknowledge Jesus Christ as our king. And we do what's right in our own eyes. We're so busy doing what's right in our own eyes instead of doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord. So Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for this book of Judges, Lord, that... Uh, just shows us just how dirty and filthy and disgusting we can be, Lord, when, when we get our eyes off of you, Lord. 
Uh, thank you for uh, opening our eyes to, uh, to the consequences of our own sin. Uh, thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Thank you for your redemption, Lord. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for your son, Lord, who willingly gave his life for our sin, Lord. In uh, Jesus' name, amen.